So I'm talking to Chris Lintott, uh, another of our award winners this evening. Thank you very much for coming along. My pleasure. Um, we want to get a little sort of insight into why it is we're giving you this award. Um, well, I just too. wanted to start. <laughs> Hopefully it's the same reason yeah, that you yeah, think well, we're giving exactly. it to you for. Um, I wanted to start really by, by talking a little bit about Galaxy Zoo, which mm. I know is now in its fourth iteration. Yes. Um, but perhaps could you just tell me a little bit about where it started and how it started? Well, it started in a pub, which is true <laughs> the of best all, ideas all do. good ideas. Yeah. Um, and I was sitting in the pub with a then PhD student called Kevin yeah. Sorinsky and we had one of those sort of everyday problems, yeah. which was that we had too many galaxies, mm -hmm. or rather we had images of a million galaxies. We wanted to sort them out by shape, because the shape tells you uh, how a galaxy is interacted with its surroundings, when and where its form starts. Yeah. It's like the integrated history of the galaxy is in its shape. Um, and Kevin had shown that it was better to have a student look at these galaxies than it was to pass them through a computer. Uh, but he'd done 50,000 and was fed up, mm -hmm. and so we were desperately staring into our beer, trying to come up with a different solution, um, and decided, not a particularly original idea at the time, but a few people had tried it, but to, to use the web to ask for help. Um, and we asked everyone to come and help us classify these galaxies, and the response um, just blew us away. Um, within a couple of days, we were doing 70,000 classifications an hour. Wow. And we're now on hundreds of millions of classifications yeah. of galaxies. Um, and it all grew from there, yeah. really. How did, you, how did you get over that sort of critical mass in the first few days? I mean, how, who did you publicise it to, to get those I, numerous people working on it so quickly? I, I think we, it was sheer blind luck, to be <laughs> honest. Um, that's not how it was supposed to be. It was okay. supposed to be a quiet side project. Yeah. I was supposed to be doing other things. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd give a talk and 50 people would answer yeah. and, and, and we'd move on like that. But I think in retrospect, it's obvious that on the internet, it's very hard to succeed quietly. Yeah. You either fail completely or yeah. you get this critical mass. We had some traffic from the BBC, mm -hmm. from the front page of Wikipedia, strangely. Oh, really? We got a lot of traffic from them, so I don't know who put yeah. us there, but thank you. Um, <laughs> and that was it. And then we had yeah. that critical mass and we were able to keep going. Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, the project obviously is in its fourth iteration, mm. but you've expanded it, haven't you? So there is the Zooniverse platform now. So how many projects do you have operating on that? Um, about 20 are live okay. now. We've had about 30. So one of the things that happened with Galaxy Zoo was we showed that the data was very good, mm -hmm. that people were outperforming computers and indeed beating Kevin, which mm -hmm. was the important thing. Poor Kevin. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. Well, he's fine. He's okay. fine. He got a job off the results, so that's good. <laughs> um, but we also got other scientists approaching us and saying, yeah. look, you know, you're people who like galaxies maybe they could classify my giraffes mm. or penguins or cells mm -hmm. or um, crystals or particle physics data or whatever. And we realized that this was a software problem that needed solving once. Um, and if we could build a platform that could support a wide variety of projects, then we could try mm -hmm. all sorts of things. And, mm -hmm. and that's what the Zooniverse is. And, mm -hmm. and that's what Galaxy Zoo grew into. Mm -hmm. So I think of Galaxy Zoo as the accidental success. Yep. Um, and Zooniverse is what came from realizing yep. that we'd hit on something that yeah. could work. I mean, we want to reward you and the Galaxy Zoo team just because, uh, for precisely that reason, in a way, that you hit on something that's mm. proved to be such a sort of fantastic model for citizen science more generally. And I, I know others have done it before, but in a way, you all sort of I, really picked up and ran. I think the thing um, is, well, what's really special about Galaxy is the attention. Yep. Um, but others have done that. There's a brilliant yep. project called Stardust at Home yep. that collected dust grains yep. from a comet and analysed them. Um, I think what's special about Galaxy Zoo is that we knew we wanted to produce science with it. Mm. And the, everything about the website was designed to be an authentic contribution mm -hmm. to science. And that's where we've succeeded. We've mm -hmm. had hundreds of, um, actually more than 100 papers have now been published using wow. Galaxy Zoo data. And that is important to me, but I think that has an interesting effect on the volunteers mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Because that authentic experience of mm -hmm. doing science um, changes you, I think. It changes mm -hmm. your attitude to science. It changes the way you read about science in mm -hmm. the paper. If you think science is something you can do on your yeah. lunch break, um, then that changes how you relate to it. And that comes, I think, from Galaxy Zoo's very strong yeah. focus on being real. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I was. Therefore, I meaningful. I, I was going to ask you, I was going to be maybe a little bit more critical. Mm. I mean, obviously, the. We like to think of it as very much democratising the, the production of sure. scientific knowledge, basically. And, and as you say, the idea that people can make a meaningful contribution. But I suppose, I mean, another way of looking at it would be that you're basically outsourcing the, the grunt labour, if you right. like. Yeah. Um, so, so how do you ensure that it is, you know, meaningful and democratising and not just, you well, know, basically taking people for Well, I think there's two halves to that. The first one is, you know, we really don't want to waste people's yep. time. And so for all the Zooniverse projects, we, we test to make sure the results are good before mm -hmm. we release them. Mm -hmm. um, but we also check that they can't easily be done by machine. Sure. We've got no interest in running Galaxy Zoo yeah. 
if somebody develops a computer uh, program that can do the job. So, so there's sort of that basic level of assurance that you mm. really are contributing. And I think that in itself is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I think that experience of an authentic contribution changes people. Um, but we also really want to encourage people to go beyond that because mm -hmm. what we've done with the first iteration of Galaxies, it was democratise the easy bit of science, sure. or at least the, the everyday bit of yeah. science. Um, and so what we've done over the years is build tools and environments and mm -hmm. discussion tools where people can go from having come in with no scientific background, classified a few galaxies, found something unusual, and we now deliberately try and take people all the way up to actually helping write mm. the papers. Wow. Um, and so we take very seriously this, this phrase that we've adopted, which yeah. is citizen science. Yeah. We mean both halves of that. Yes, it's got to be real science. Uh, but yes, if you want to, you should have the yeah. opportunity to go much deeper as well. So do you actually have some individuals who've been co-authors on papers oh. and who've come through just working on the platform? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Both for okay. Galaxy Zoo, but particularly our planet hunting project, yeah. Planet Hunters. Um, a lot of the work... Um, the, the initial work on the discoveries that we've made, including mm. the first planet with four suns in its sky, has come from the volunteers on the forum. Yeah. And actually this summer, going back to Galaxy Zoo, we've been running a project called Galaxy Zoo Quench, where we took a group of people and said from the beginning, right, you're going to do all the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, a large group of them classified galaxies, and then a smaller group of them used tools to um, interrogate those results. Yeah. They've come up with something interesting and a smaller group of them are now writing the paper collaboratively online with a couple of my colleagues. Wow. So if we publish that, I think that's the first soup to nuts yeah. citizen science yeah. in which it really has been led by the volunteers from the beginning. Yeah. That's where we want to get to. Are there, are there any obvious limits to this? I mean, are there particular, presumably there's a, a sort of narrow area of science that's particularly applicable to this, maybe dealing with sort of visual... Yeah, there's uh, a narrow area of techniques, the right. pattern recognition right. um, region. Um, and not all projects are suitable. Yeah. Um, you know, there are things that you do need expertise for, yeah. and, and where that you know, I don't know if you want to do DIY genome splicing. I suspect you probably still need a yeah. biology degree, yeah. um, and I suspect that will always be true. Mm. Um, I, I think really, certain w what's important is to find a meaningful micro task, mm -hmm. a way in for people mm -hmm. um, that's convincing as a, as a way into the science. After that, people can go sure. and do everything and they can work to very high levels. But, but we've restricted ourselves to these areas where um, there are these first tasks. Yeah. I think the other interesting limit is whether the, there will always be these projects. Yeah. So there's an assumption, if you, I go and talk to a computer science department, there's an assumption that we're a few years away always mm. from solving all of these problems with AI and computer vision. Mm. Um, what I my bet is that what you'll see is the proportion of images of, of data that has to be classified by humans will drop, mm. uh, but the total may well stay very consistent right. because of course data sets are growing yeah. and that what we'll see is humans increasingly doing the specialised yeah. looking for weird stuff, yeah. which is what we're really good at and we'll hand computers the, the routine. Yeah. Uh, last question, do you think, obviously as social scientists we're very interested at the moment about the potential of big data, do you mm. think do you think this is an area where actually we've got a bit to learn from, from what you guys have been doing? I think so, so. it would be yeah. fun to think about. Mostly yeah. we think that we need social scientists because we're <laughs> trying, you know, one way to phrase the last six years of galaxies, it was an attempt to understand why the mm. hell this works <laughs> um, and why these people give their time to, to citizen science. So, so I always think about it that way. The other way around, I think wherever there's a large data set, yeah. wherever you're looking at patterns, I think there's potential for collaboration mm. and for exploration. And the tools that are built well for citizens to do that mm. also become the tools that the researchers use. Mm. So you'll find the Galaxy Zoo science team using the same tools we built to enable this deeper collaboration. Yeah. And I think that's something that spreads across disciplines. I don't quite know if that's the same as learning from us, but I think there's an analogy there. Yeah, no, I think so. I think there's another potential. Anyway, you're doing such great work. It's an honour to have you this evening, so thank you very much, Chris. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Whatever I've got the award <laughs> for, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.